Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. So the 2020 Chevrolet Corvette finally debuted last week, and it was a new car launch for the ages. Honestly, no one has been able to stop talking about it, including Motor One. We have written so many articles about the Corvette since its introduction that you might as well call us CorvetteOne.com. On today's episode, we're going to keep the conversation going and give our honest, unvarnished take on the new mid-engine C8 Corvette. Joining me is MotorOne.com managing editor and amateur horologist, Brandon Turkist. How are you doing, Brandon? I'm well, John. How are you? Very well. And by horologist, I mean a watch enthusiast, not the other kind. Um, also with us... I mean, how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> good point. Good point. Uh, also with us is writer and the man with the most alliterative, alliterative name I've ever met, Anthony Alanis. How are you doing, Anthony? I'm doing great. Thanks. So, uh, let's talk Corvette. We actually already had a complete episode about this car uh, two episodes ago, leading up to the debut. Now that it's happened, though, honestly, I didn't, I didn't know if we were going to talk about it this week, but we have not stopped writing about this car. Um, <laughs> it, it's probably been more, the ha- more than half of the articles we've published since its debut have been about the Corvette, and um, they've been extremely popular. People want keep want to know more, want to keep reading about it, want to keep seeing it. Um, the The debut was a pretty big fanfare held in a hangar in Southern California. It was live streamed all over the world. Um, although I don't know, were uh, were any either of you at the debut of the C7 Corvette uh, a number of years ago? I was, yeah. I, I, I've heard people say that the C7 debut was actually a little bit like larger and more bombastic than the, the C8, which I thought is kind of interesting considering how, how significant the C8 is. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't at the debut for the C8, obviously, um, but I, I recall from the C7 that there were a lot of exhibits and a lot more cars. I, apparently, there were only about three cars for the 1,000 or 1,500 people that were in attendance. Like three so, examples of the C8? Of the C8, yeah. yeah, and I don't, I don't recall that being a problem like when they had the C7 a lot more, launched. Yeah, like they had a lot more just cars on the on the floor. Yeah, and for I, people to check I, out. Yeah, and I also wouldn't be surprised if they had a you know fewer people too. It it didn't feel like a thousand person affair, but I that was that was six years ago now, and I've gone to a lot of auto shows since then, so my memory is a little bit fuzzy. I, I've been trying to tell people that. There, there's only a f- few cars that can have this bigger of uh, a debut, this this large of a significance. Uh, particularly in the U.S., it's Mustang and Corvette probably are the two biggest. Whenever we have a new Mustang or, or a new Corvette, it's the biggest. It's the biggest thing happening that you can imagine. But yeah, Wrangler. I would still put Mustang and Corvette ahead of Wrangler, but especially because Wrangler never changes too much but the others when they have full generational changes you know a mustang can can get pretty different uh but you know imagine uh, this happens once in a lifetime when the car goes from front engine to mid-engine i mean imagine if the mustang suddenly (laughs) went mid-engine that would be crazy Uh, and yet this is what happened with the corvette so this is honestly a once in a generation kind of car debut um and so now that the card's out, one thing that was immediately apparent as soon as the car appeared on stage was the spy shots, the renderings were all about 100% accurate. Like the car that Chevy had driving around in camouflage was not camouflaged very well. And what we saw is pretty much what we got. Um, so I want to go around the table and get everybody's opinion first on the styling. So Anthony, why don't I start with you? How did the, the styling of the C8 hit you? Uh, I like it. It's a lot better than I thought it would be. I don't know if the camouflage on all the prototypes and test mules that we saw hide, well, probably did hide a lot of the design lines and more, I guess, finer details of the car, but I think it looks great. Uh, how about you, Brandon? What did, how did it hit you? I mean, there, there are definitely angles where it looks better. Um, I, I definitely see it from certain angles especially the profile it looks the proportions look a little bit ungainly i don't like some of the smaller details either it's a mid-engine shape i've always found works really well if you either go kind of uh rounded and organic or go really crazy and angular and 
the C8 kind of tries to play both sides and it doesn't do it that well, I don't think. Uh, yeah, my bigger really, issue is... That's a really good observation. I, I kind of see that with the Acura NSX. I kind of have the same uh, opinion of it like that. And I think actually there, there's some proportional elements of the C8 that remind me of the NSX. Sure, absolutely. And I've, I've heard people make that comparison that it looks like the NSX. I, I don't really see that. I There are proportions that are similar, but they're, they're similar because they're inherent to all mid-engine cars. So I, I, I kind of disagree with that because I think I think actually mid engine cars can be a lot different uh, from each other in in especially when you like you mentioned when you look at them in kind of profile um, and I think the the NSX and the Corvette kind of share some of these just broad stroke silhouette elements maybe whereas if you look at like another mid-engine car like a like a hurricane or something like it's completely different it's like a wedge a pure wedge and so i i think there can be um like, like a mid-engine design can be pretty varied um depending on how you do it but i take your point that you can either go like like or like organic and smooth or wild but if you don't do one of those and you end up in the middle it's this it's this kind of weird zone that i think the yeah. corvette and the nsx live and and this Corvette is notable because I, I've I've always found that in the past when you remove the roof of the Corvette coupe with you know the T tops for lack of a better word you take the T tops out it always improves the look and that isn't really the case here I haven't seen a single angle with the roof panel removed that I actually like hmm, that's interesting I think it looks pretty good with the roof removed I think it looks pretty good with it on and off or it doesn't make it better or worse at first when I saw it I'm like. This is positive. I like this. You know, my first impression was good. Then I started hearing from some people actually in, in the design community, and whether they be car designers or artists or you know just in, in that kind of genre, um, and they actually are very critical of it, um, respectfully so because they know how difficult it is to design a car like this, such an iconic car, and to do it within a company as bureaucratic as GM. So that is no small feat just to get a, a halfway decent design out the door. I think my my least favorite part of the design is the rear end. It's it's very busy. I, I don't perceive very many ties to traditional Corvette design in the rear end at all. Um, and it, there's a lot of angles going on. Um, I like the, the, the kind of blade it has over the, the air intakes on either side, kind of at the, at the rear edge of the doors. Um, it's a little bit reminiscent of le, like the blade on the Audi R8, right? It's kind of- I, I, don't see, I don't see that at all. I only mean, I don't think it looks like the blade on the Audi R8, but I think it's like a little design signature. My, my issue with that is that it's, when you look at the rest of the car and the, and the more rounded nature, and especially uh, immediately around that detail, that stands out as being this angular, sharp thing. And so when I've been playing it with the Corvette configurator, every single car I design has that side blade as, as body color. Oh, interesting. Because it, it just looks so out of place to me. But see, that's interesting that you describe the car. I, I, I guess that the, the car is it's kind of like half organic lines, half... Um, smooth lines and a half angular like it really depending on what area of the car you're looking at you're either seeing angles or you're either seeing smooth lines so it's really strange that way um, one thing I found interesting is um, um, Ferrari chat is a sister site to Motor One and it's the largest Ferrari forum in the world so obviously there was a lot of conversation about the Corvette the mid-engine Corvette there when it debuted and a couple things they were talking about is one it looks like a poor man's Ferrari which it uh, does a little bit. I can't deny that it like if you squint, it kind of looks like you know an F four thirty from a while yeah, ago but or something. Do we do we really think the Ferrari, that Ferrari owners, Ferrari enthusiasts, loyalists, people that that you know love their Ferraris, were ever going to say anything different about a mid engine Corvette? Well, so one the other you, interesting thing that they were saying though was that they were curious to know if the introduction of the Corvette would crash the, the used market for mid-engine Ferraris. So if a young person coming up who was a Ferrari enthusiast, let's say, if they had their choice between a, a used mid-engine Ferrari for like a hundred some thousand dollars or a mid-engine Corvette for under a hundred thousand dollars that was, you know, brand new with a warranty and had better performance, 
would, would that kind of soften the market for mid-engine Ferraris that a lot of these guys in the forum own? Um, uh, I think I think that's that that will be entirely dependent on how much it costs to maintain the Corvette. Well, that's a good question. Because mid engine cars are hard to maintain, and Ferraris are notoriously expensive to maintain. Yeah, so, we're very far out though on any type of like data on. Oh, totally. On what it'll cost to maintain a Corvette, oh, and more particularly, like how difficult it is to work on, because no no mechanics have gotten their hands on it. Um, so yeah, in terms of the styling, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle. I, I definitely see, I, I can see very plainly that it was a, a kind of designed by committee affair. Like, like I can see where a lot of decisions were made that weren't connected to each other. A lot of, you know, an executive raises an eyebrow and that line gets drawn this way instead of that way. But John, the, that's I, absolutely crazy. I've never heard of that happening with a GM product ever. Well, yeah, especially with a GM product. Um, I, but all that said, I don't think the end result is ugly. I, I, I gen, genuinely think it's an attractive vehicle. You know, there's certainly ways I could spec it to where, where I would like it. Um, I would probably have the um, contrast in color on the blade because I'm a fan of the blade. I don't, do they have a name for it? Because it's not the blade. So I don't know if they... I don't, they, I don't think they've got... I, no, I don't think they, they should, have. They should coin a name for it. That's like part of the... Part don't of the don't give them any ideas. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about let's talk about specs and performance because that's another thing that really blew the, the roof off the debut was the fact that um, they announced that it's, it'll be powered by um, a new version of the 6.2 liter V8. Uh, obviously, this car is not going you know twin turbo V6 or or anything like that. It's sticking to its tried and true recipe of naturally aspirated V8. And at least with the Z51 performance package, it'll make 495 horsepower, which is a considerable amount. Um, and I think um, zero to 60 below three seconds with the Z51 package. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. All right. So how does again? How does that strike you, Anthony? Is that is that more than enough? Or let me ask you this: Is it too much? Did they raise the bar too high with the base Corvette, and now they've got to beat it with? You know whatever they come up with whatever they come up with next you know z06 if it's going to be that zr1 whatever possibly i mean it's definitely a lot of power and if the price stays where it is um under allegedly sixty thousand, but we don't know by how much um you know i kind of thought if it's so cheap and with so much power will that be like the new mustang thing where people are getting the car when they don't have the experience with the horsepower and causing those sorts of issues um, especially with the whole taking the engine from the front to the rear. If somebody's been driving a Corvette for a while and decides to upgrade, you know, what issues can that cause? But I, I think it's plenty of power. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting. I hadn't thought of that. But, you know, you mentioned the Mustang and you go back thinking about the GT500 Mustang from a few generations ago when it got up to like 500 horsepower. And I, I, I don't know if it was the case that it was just before electronic nannies and stability control got really really good but i remember that car was dangerous that car well, like that was, that was a solid rear axle too i mean that's true that's true true that's that's like that's like uh it's not a good combination it I, can't of, it, I can't think of a clever analogy on the spot it wasn't but i mean anthony's point about switching from front engine to mid-engine I mean, it's not that mid-engine cars are inherently like more dangerous in terms of handling, but they're very different. So if you put a bunch of guys who've been used to, you know, driving their um, C7 Corvettes fast on public roads, and you throw them in one of these Corvettes, I mean, it's quite possible we could see a lot of people um, with some insurance claims um, from wrapping their their new Corvettes around a tree. That that said, you know, this could be a case like you know, you take the the Dodge Challenger Hellcat. Um, and there's just, you know, there's so many electronic nannies that you have to turn off before you un unleash the full thing that most people are never driving it totally unleashed. So it could be a case where, you know, they make it at least you have to go through a few, ho uh, through a few hoops to fully unleash the car. And then that kind of, you know, makes sure that people are reined in and protected from themselves a little bit. Um, that'll be interesting. I'll, I'll be interested, you know, when we go on the first drive to see if that's the case, or if they just have one button on the dash, like the the Z button uh, that's on the steering wheel, where you just like click that and it turns everything off and you're co completely um, unleashed. Then, if that's the case, I think that could be pretty dangerous. Um, 
But what about you, Brandon? Do you think the power is enough, too much, just right? Well, no, I think the power is fine. I think the I think the problem is, and I've I've, I've had this conversation a lot since the Corvette debuted. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I drove the McLaren 720S Spider. That's a car with over 700 horsepower that'll get to 60 in 2.8 seconds. And I took a lot of my friends and my family for a ride, and all of them remarked on how it just takes your breath away. It is a different level of performance than anything you've ever dealt with before. And when you put people that aren't aren't ready for that kind of performance, someone that's owned a C7 that you know would get to 60 in 3.9 or 4 seconds or 4.1 seconds, or even a C, C6 or uh, C5 owner, and they jump up to a car that can go that fast, it it, it worries me because unless you unless your perception of speed has adjusted to that, you're going to be in a situation where you stand on the pedal and you get all this power and all this speed and your mind isn't going to be able to process what is coming towards you. If it's the right time to do this, if the road is smooth enough, if there's a pothole coming up, I, I disagree. I disagree with you, John. Mid-engine cars are inherently more difficult to drive for inexperienced drivers. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that's fair to say. It's so it's, it's not even, it's not even a level of familiarity. It's that, you know, you have a whole different set of physics at work than you do in in a front engine V8 than you do in a mid engine car. So even if there is you know a perfect fifty fifty weight distribution and all this other good stuff going on, I'm I'm definitely concerned that this is going to be too much car for uh, a lot of consumers that that are considering it. Well, I think uh, I think that comes down to again uh, how good are the nannies and how easy or difficult are they to turn off and are they going to offer a driving school? Are they are, are they, and it will I, you know I doubt it'll come with and the they price. they absolutely should offer yeah. a driving school and, and a lot of, a lot of vehicles a lot of companies do uh, Ford has one um, for its STs and and Mustangs um, BMW has a driving school so um, it's a very good idea especially for these cars that. Um, do come with so much power that is so accessible. Um, so I want to move on to, I think, the, 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 the one thing about the Corvette that probably made everyone in the room and um, online gasp uh, when it was announced. The, the price is going to be, uh, the starting price is going to be below 60000 um, so That's what uh, GM and uh, Chevy uh, said. So they didn't give any other details about price. Um, now I want to I want to give my opinion on this first, and then I'll, I'll get your reaction. So for for one, I don't think anybody like I think it's going to be like most cars where they they do have a version of the car for the the base price, but dealerships aren't going to carry that car. It's going to be very difficult to get that car for sixty thousand um, dollars. As a matter of fact, all all of the performance uh, numbers that we're getting excited about are for the Corvette with the Z51 package. We don't know how much the Z51 package is going to cost, but you know it's definitely going to bring the car above sixty thousand. Um, so we have no idea how much this Stingray Corvette could go up to. You know, can it go up to eighty thousand? Should it go up to a hundred thousand? Uh, when you load it up, um, I don't know. So I think you know. Yes, it's it's a great advertising line, and it, it worked for them to announce that it would start under sixty. But I feel like very few people, um, if any, are going to buy a sub sixty thousand dollar Corvette. That said, putting that number sixty thousand into some context, somebody said to me, or, or no, I read on on Facebook yesterday, um, if a fully loaded Toyota Supra with 300 and what is it 330 335 horsepower is five thousand dollars less than the base price of a new stingray corvette and that to me is kind of mind-boggling um because they are cars in two completely different classes and to have their prices be um anywhere near each other even if it's the lowest price of one and the highest price of the other is is crazy this i mean the 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 amount of power you're getting for the money here, the bang for the buck, is might be one of the best of all time. Um, and yes, that does come with some of the concerns that we've already mentioned about people who don't have the experience um, getting access to that much power. But man, I mean, you know, 
I think we've we've always applauded, you know, automakers that that price things um, where we feel like you know, it's a good value and we're not being gouged. Um, and I think this is just an incredible. As a matter of fact, I'm on record in the last couple episodes saying that I thought the starting price would be eighty thousand, and I could not have been more wrong. Um, it is. It is. They have completely redefined. I think what performance value. Uh, means and I'm just really excited to actually get a, an honest to goodness configurator with prices so that we can see exactly you know exactly how expensive the Corvette you really want is going to be because like I said I doubt it's going to be 60,000 um, what do you guys think Brandon I mean is it is it amazing is it is it the the best performance bargain uh, that we've ever seen or is it kind of a smoke show I mean, sure. It's it's a fantastic performance bargain if you can find one. It's it's the sixty thousand dollars C eight Corvette is going to be like that seventy inch OLED TV that's on you know the doorbuster on Black Friday. You're you're never going to find it. They can advertise it all day long until they're blue in the face. That car does not exist. Now, right. if they're never going to have allows, it on the dealer lot, and they're going yeah, to if GM allows it. owners to go in and order it, then yeah, it's probably a pretty good bargain. Which I don't think they will. I think they'll just build all they can and send them to dealer lots, and you can buy. Nah, them see, I I I really disagree with that. I get, I get the impression that the Corvette is is one of those cars that people people order, the custom order pretty frequently. You you think about the the programs that they've had in the past, the build your own engine program, and the, the special touches. So I I definitely think there's going to be a, a fair percentage of of consumers that that will custom order and they may try and take advantage and say, I want the cheapest Corvette. I want the biggest bang for my buck. Um, that said, I, I think that your $80,000 estimate is much more correct as like a real world, uh, base price. Like what you're going to see, I, it's like 75 to $80,000 Corvettes. I think will be thick on the ground at dealer lots when they finally start arriving. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Anthony? What is the, how does the price sound to you? You're going to replace your Mustang with it? Uh, no, probably not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think the price, like the, the sixty thousand dollars, like is a good marketing campaign. However, I don't think you'll want to drive that car. I think you'll want the Z fifty one package. I think you'll want, you know, maybe some color on the interior. You know, I don't think we've seen a an actual Corvette under that price. I think we've all seen them spec pretty high, you know, from GM. But I think it, you'll want to spend at least seventy seventy five thousand on one. <laughs> Yeah, we don't even know like what the base Corvette will come with, right? So we don't even know if it'll be like, I mean, it'll be livable, but will it be, will it have enough of what people want to, or, or will you basically be forced to start adding options right from the get-go? Um, I mean, GM's, GM's product strategy in the past is, is very much favored um, hiding the, the best goodies in the option oh, sheet. Oh, completely. So... I wouldn't be surprised if you know the base car comes out with like an analog gauge cluster and uh, manual seats and, and all sorts of other little penny pinching options that that allow it to get that price. You know, we and, uh, we published uh, right after it debuted a comparison between the Corvette and its um, kind of its new and old class of competitors. And it is astonishing the difference between the base price of the new Corvette, you know, which is somewhere south of sixty thousand dollars, and the base price of all of these competitors. If you take Acura NSX, base price one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. <laughs> That's insane. Its base price is is one hundred thousand dollars more than uh, a C8 Corvette. Um, an Audi R8. Uh, $171,000. Now, both of those cars actually have more horsepower than the Corvette Stingray, um, but they're not actually like that much faster. You know, like, you know, the, the Acura NSX gets to 60 in 2.9 seconds, and we know the Corvette's going to do it below three seconds. So the, the difference in performance is not that great. Certainly not great enough to justify over $100,000. Um, and even, even the the longtime foe of the Corvette, the 911 Carrera, a 911 Carrera S base price is $115,000. Like, this is insane, the, the difference between the, the base price of the Corvette and the competition out there. Like, literally nothing starts below $100,000.
So already it has $40,000 on any of those cars. Um, so you, you, so basically you could say you have $40,000 to, you know, get whatever options you want because you're still going to be way below the next competitor. And you not only have money for options, but for aftermarket too, whatever that turns out to be. Um, that's a lot of money to definitely increase that horsepower by quite a bit. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a huge aftermarket. As a matter of fact, I like, you know, the, the Corvette has always had a lot of different either tuners out there or third-party companies that make special edition vets. Um, you know, I, I can't wait to see some of those uh, come out. Um, I don't even know which ones are. Is Callaway still in business? Because I used to love the Callaway Corvettes in the 90s. Oh, no. I don't even know. They, they, wasn't they, didn't they have a sledgehammer or something like that? I don't know. They all I, all I remember is that they made those turn those terrible C fives into like C one retro monstrosities. No, they did some other cool stuff. I remember Motor Trend used to like have a, uh, a battle of the tuners that they would always participate in, and they had some pretty cool cars. Um, so I, I don't honestly I don't know what the next step is for the vet. Obviously, we're still talking about any Corvette information that comes out. Um, but, you know, I feel like there, there's still a lot more to go. We still need more specific pricing information. We still, they, they don't even know the top speed of the car. We wrote about that the other day. Um, they just haven't tested what its top speed is. They have no idea. Um, so one of, one of the things that I, I think they, I, and this is pure speculation, I think they are sacrificing top speed to get that zero to 60 number. I think this thing is geared so much for acceleration. If you look at the cars that are, can get to 1,603 seconds, most of them can do, you know, 200 miles an hour easily. This is or, not a 200 I would mile say, an hour car. I would say 190. I'm looking at yeah. actually the competitor thing, and most are like high 180s or 190. This, this I would bet. I would bet this car is tops out at 170, 175. Maybe, although you know, nowadays with an eight-speed transmission, it's got an eight-speed you know dual clutch. With with eight gears, it might have a large enough spread to you know get a top speed that inches towards. Yeah, but with only five hundred horsepower, with only five hundred horsepower. Uh yeah, I it'll be. It's got to be tough. super light. It 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 have to be super light. Yeah, I I, I think I generally think you're right. It's definitely not going to break 200. I think it'll be. No, I'll no, be surprised no, no. if I'll be surprised if it breaks 190. I think uh, low 180s, high high 170s is probably what we should expect. And again, we don't know what the what the next models will be called. We don't know if they'll be Z06. I think somebody told me ZR1. It, it, reusing ZR1 is very unlikely. They might bring back the Zora name or something like that. Um, but we we have. Um, versions of the Corvette coming that will surely break 200, 200 miles an hour easily. Um, you know, this one's 495 horsepower, and we're pretty sure we have 600 and 800 horsepower versions coming as well. Um, also, they've, they've not been very good at keeping uh, or, or at denying the fact that at least partial electrification will probably come, much like the Acura NSX uses, you know, the um, internal combustion engine on the rear wheels and some electric motors on the front wheels to create a kind of through the road all wheel drive system. Um, it, so it, it sounds like that's coming to the Corvette as well to make the, the, the most capable, highest, highest performing version, whatever that's called. Um, I'm actually pretty excited to see it race too. Um, I want to see it at Le Mans, and, um, you know, mixing it up with the Ferraris and the Porsches and the four GTs uh, as well. I actually, I'm a little sad that we don't have the, the most capable version of the new Corvette to go against the Ford GT. I feel like those are going to be two ships kind of passing in the night. Oh, I'm sure someone will. Yeah, I just think the Ford GT's run will be over by the time the, the you know, whatever that I, I, is called comes around. I don't know. I mean, there's the, the allocation for GT, there's still a fair amount to do. Didn't they announce, though, the one at... Um, at Goodwood that they debut, the Mark II is going to be the last one. No, that's the last racing variant. Oh, that's that's a, that's a track variant. only. They they're still building road cars. All right, well maybe Ford will keep building them until people don't want to buy them. Well, I, I think they've got an allocation. I think they haven't fulfilled it yet, and they yeah. they have a production schedule. And yeah. All right. Well, we would love to hear what you all think about the Corvette. Um, as we said, we're not done talking about it, and we probably won't be for many weeks and months. Um, so you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Motor One Com. And, of course, on our website, motor1.com, where you can find us in the comments. 
And we're uh, coming up, we're going to talk about what we've been driving this week in our favorite segment of the show. Uh, but before that, a reminder that if you are listening uh, to the episode online, you can also get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, um, and wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. So um, we'd hope that you'd subscribe so that you can get every, uh, every week's new episode as soon as it's ready. Welcome back. During this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week, and today we're going to start with Anthony. So, Anthony, what car are you driving this week? Uh, I have a 2013 Ford Mustang. 2013. I... Yep. Interesting. Is it a what is it? A GT base model? No, no, it's a V6 with a stick. V6 with a stick. Awesome. Yep. How long have you had it? Uh, seven years. Wow! Wow! How many miles? 105,000. All right, all right. How, well, what, how's it? Um, how's it hanging on? Like uh, a hundred thousand plus mile Mustang. I'm sure you've had uh, a few things you've had to replace. Um, actually, it's been great. I just now have my first like real suspension squeak um, driving over Michigan roads. So, um, other than that, I've had very few issues other than the uh, killer airbags that I had to get replaced. But it's been a wonderful experience. Good gas mileage. Fun to drive. I mean. Are you driving that? Are you driving that through the winter too? Yep. I was gonna say, do you swap the tires out for winter tires or? Uh, no, nope, I always keep all seasons. They seem to do fine. I've never had any trouble, and that's even when I worked in Detroit or Ann Arbor, which is about an hour drive. I've never wow. had any trouble. So impressive. <laughs> it's been great. I love it. So. All right. Well, uh, Brandon, I think you have something pretty excited this week. What are you driving? Yes, I am driving the Audi RS5 Sportback. Ah, the RS5 Sportback. So this is what the four-door coupe version of the um, kind of like well, kind of the A5, but the RS version. Well, it's 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 more of a liftback, and I I, I like liftbacks. I I wish more car companies would would do liftbacks because they're such a, a good useful uh, body style. Uh, but yes, this is this is the RS5. Uh, and it's got four doors. That's that's really its distinguishing feature um, from the coupe body style. Uh, this car is quite potent. It has a three liter twin turbocharged V6. And because I'm bad at my job, I didn't look up the horsepower before I came on the call. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. It's 444. Yeah, 444 horsepower. Um, this this car, I've I've had a lot of friends around uh, the industry drive this, this exact model. Actually, it's kind of been the village bicycle here in Detroit, and the 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 remarks have all kind of follow, followed a similar theme that you know it, it's not as fun, it's not as it's not as exciting as the last RS5, and I I don't really agree with that. I think this this car is. It suffers from the same problem that the BMW M3 suffered from when it went from a V8 to a straight six in that the straight six in that car and the V6 in this car both replaced what were some of the most widely beloved V8 engines on the market. The 4.2 liter V8 in the last RS5 and the the, uh, previous RS4 was one of the best V8s of the past 20 years. Bar none, it was fantastic. They used it in the R8. It was a fantastic engine. And there was no possible way that this V6 was going to fill those shoes. It's getting accused of not having as much character and not being as likable. Well, and- and I, I, I don't really agree with that. It, it's different. That doesn't make it worse. It's funny because I that that 4.2 liter V8 engine that was in the last RS5 I had a love affair with. I loved that engine um, specifically in that car. So yeah, it was I, fantastic. And I have driven this RS5 Sportback as well, and I kind of had the same um, reaction to it, where I felt like it lacked either the soul or the passion or, or whatever. It so just didn't, didn't so here's. Me. Here's really where I see the problem is one of the one of the defining traits of that that 4.2 was that you could just rev the nuts off of it. I mean, it revved, I want to say up around 8000 RPM. It it felt like this this purebred stallion of an engine. And this engine tops out at about 6300 6400 rpm you look at the the torque spread on the 4.2 versus this the the 4.2 didn't have a lot of torque and you really had to work you had to be smart about how you drove it to get the most out of it 
this engine is much more effortless. It's 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 you get in the car and you hit the pedal and it goes fast. So it's not as demanding of a vehicle to drive as as the and old think, RS5 I, was and the RS4 and so on. I think the the issue is that that makes it less engaging in a way because it is so automatic and so point and point and shoot. Uh, as a matter of fact, like you, I mean, it's got great power. Uh, it's zero to sixty in three point eight seconds, so it's not slower than the old RS5. But like you said, the old RS5, it was um, it was a it was a while ago. I mean, it was uh, more than a few model years ago, and it was just that you're right you did have to engage with it more to get everything out of it and i think it felt a little more fun that way whereas this you get in and it's by by default it's in comfort mode and you're just driving it around like a normal car and and so i i think that's the issue it's just kind of like its liveliness is is either not as accessible or just buried a little bit deeper so that said that you know we're we're sitting here we're saying this and we we each drive literally hundreds of new cars each year and it, it's the same with a lot of our colleagues that have made similar arguments. And I don't think this is one of those cases where I think we do a poor job of putting ourselves in the shoes of the customer that walks in and is going to go for a test drive in that car and stand on the throttle and they're be like, holy moly, I get 60 in 3.8 seconds. Where do I sign? You know, I, I, I think this this car is the right thing for the market, for the customers that are interested in it. The ones that really want that 4.2 V8, they obviously have the money to go and get a used RS5 or a used RS4 or even a used R8. So, and they can get it with a manual too. I think, well, you can get the RS4 with a manual and the R8. I don't remember about the RS5. But the 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 customers that are that are looking at this car, they're they're not gonna they're not gonna have any most likely they're not gonna have a reference point to say that the four two was great and this three liter isn't as good because X Y and Z. Right, and the old RS five it wasn't it, it, it's not like the Corvette where there's a legion of people you know who are waiting for the next one to live up to the old one. You know, precisely. So I, think, I think them changing kind of the personality of the RS five is totally fine. And you're right, they changed it to go I think with the market. Um, and not not kind of keep a more maybe emotional more more analog machine. They they just made it another really great Audi, which is what Audi does. I mean, Audi just pumps out really good cars. And I, you know, maybe I, they're, maybe they're not always uh, best in class, but they're always like top top of the game, top of the segment. I will say the one thing that that I'm absolutely madly in love with this with this car is how it looks. It is so darn handsome. It's it's the one I'm driving is bright red. It has a blacked out grill. It has blacked out belt line. Huge twenty one inch wheels with tiny little sidewalls. Smoked tail lights. It looks absolutely fantastic. Like every time I walk outside, I just kind of look at it and just it's like a slack jawed stare. And there are very few cars now that 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 do that to me. But this one is so so pretty. Yeah, as much as I like to um, kind of get annoyed with automakers that are turning every coupe into a you know like a uh, every every two-door into a four-door coupe i gotta say some of them look damn pretty like some of them look so good i wonder like why do you even make the sedan version? that's, Just sell that's the, the thing if, if if you know if you're the thing you care about is how good your car looks if you're in that class ignore mercedes ignore, definitely ignore bmw this is such a stunning car i'd say it's almost better looking than the julia and i love the julia all right, so this week I am, um, I'm actually traveling um, and I'm at our headquarters, our company headquarters in Miami um, where there's like a whole slew of uh, vehicles to drive and the one I got um, for the few days I'm down here is the Chevy, Bla Chevy Blazer, um, which I've driven before and I reviewed actually uh, for the site and I'm a fan of and as a matter of fact, this one I'm driving now is kind of the more pimped out version. Uh, I think the one I the one I reviewed was more of I think what <laughs> what a normal family person would buy. This one is a really poppy red with black wheels. Like it's it's trimmed to look you know to stand out. A it's not the it's not the old Blazer. It's not it's not a true SUV. It can't go off road and it is not you know rough and tumble you know an adventure vehicle. Um, it has these th this kind of Camaro inspired design that I think looks honestly it looks better than the current Camaro. Like I would rather be seen driving a, the, a that Blazer. that bar is not high though. That's true, but nevertheless, I, I think it's one of the best looking um, two row midsize crossovers. I think it looks fantastic. 
Uh, I, and I do love the subtle uh, callbacks, design cues that they take from the Camaro, both in the interior and the exterior. Although it's funny because I think the the exterior design elements they're taking from the Camaro aren't from the current Camaro. They're from like the Camaro a generation or two ago when it still looked good. Um, what I would what I would love to see for this vehicle is just more like give me give me a, a version of the Blazer to combat the um, Ford Edge ST with some some serious horsepower. Um, I, I even had fun uh, a while back and have our renderist make a GMC version of the Blazer so that we could imagine what a new, um, what is it, a GMC, imagine what a new GMC Typhoon would be if it were based on the Blazer. So, um, so yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a great vehicle and I've been enjoying it. I honestly though, as, as much as I like it, I don't, I'm not really a fan of the segment itself of midsize SUVs because if, if I were at a dealership and they had a full gamut of all SUV classes, if I looked at the midsize SUV, I'd probably ask myself, can I really get away with getting a compact SUV for a lot less money that is pretty much almost the same size? Or if I really need the space, why don't I just go to a three row uh, SUV instead of a, instead of a two row midsize? So to me, I would, I would easily talk myself out of ever buying a, a midsize uh, crossover SUV like like the Blazer because I'd probably go either above or below that segment but um, for those who um, who buy in that segment and it has exploded in the last like two model years um, I really like it as as a as an option all right so that brings us to the end of our show uh, you can follow Brandon Turkus on Twitter at Brandon Turkus uh, Anthony you can find on Twitter at Anthony underscore Alaniz that's A-L-A-N-I-Z and you can find me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, I want to thank you two uh, for joining me on the show today. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks. It was great. Yep. And of course, thank all of you out there for listening. We'll see you next week.